All right, I'm going to work a couple of problems for you that are actually two-dimensional uh, Coulomb's Law problems. The last problems that we worked really were one-dimensional. They were just three objects, and we could have four or five or how many, however many we wanted all in the line, one-dimensional. But now we're going to work 2D problems. These 2D problems where I am adding up forces is identical to adding vectors. So it would be a good idea if you're unfamiliar with how to add vectors in two dimensions to go ahead and pause the video and then go back to your notes, maybe go back to any other videos and check out adding force vectors or adding vectors in two dimension. Um, because here I have a water molecule with an angle between my two hydrogen bonds. Now just for the sake of argument here, uh, even though uh, water is a polar molecule, meaning that the electrons go back and forth, back and forth, we're going to consider the oxygen to have a negative two charge and our hydrogens to have plus one charges over there. So in other words, it's like both electrons at this point in time uh, are belonging to the oxygen, leaving hydrogen with positive one and oxygen with negative two. So we don't have to deal with, uh, with, with our standard you know, covalent bonds trying to figure out the sharing ratio and everything else there. Now, um, since I have that idea down pat, uh, let's look at what's going on. I'm going to have, if I'm dealing with, let's see what the force is on my oxygen atom over here. Um, so on this oxygen atom, I have two forces occurring. I have a positive and negative, right? So there's an attraction from this oxygen atom towards the hydrogen getting pulled that way. And a, po and a positive and negative again. So there's an attraction from the oxygen atom getting pulled up this way. Now, I can adjust this uh, oxygen atom in whatever uh, you know, motion I would like, turning it around like this or, or lining it up like that or, or like this, however I would like. But it's a lot, uh, it's, it's very wise if you'll pick a, uh, a, a spot that will line up very easily along the axis. In other words, I'm going to pick it like this because if I draw an xy axis on it, right, on my oxygen atom, one of these forces now is going to go directly along the x-axis and the other one's going to go up in an angle and check out that I know the angle, it's going to be 104.5 uh, degrees. That's the angle between uh, the two hydrogens and a bent molecule like this. So now just think adding vectors. I have two vectors. I have my blue vector, which is this hydrogen, right, getting the hydrogen pulling the oxygen that way, opposites attract. And then I have this vector, which is this hydrogen attracting the oxygen molecule this way. Whenever I have two vectors, all I'm going to do is divide them into components. And then remember, we use sine for y, cosine for x, right, and we add them all up. And we also, we want the angle, um, whenever we're doing this, we want the angle measured all the way around to the zero. Right? Whenever we have the angle measured all the way around to the zero, things work out very nicely for us. So breaking this into components here, I've got just my, and I'll label this the force of hydrogen one, force one maybe. We'll call this hydrogen one and this hydrogen two up here. I got force one going that way. I'm going to call to the right positive and left negative. And I've got force in the x, and this is, I'll maybe put F x1, and there is no fy for one. Force fx2, the force of uh, this hydrogen, right, that's pulling up this way, but there is a little x component here, right? Uh, give you a quick reminder if I draw in a little right triangle, right, I got a y component and an x component there that I have to deal with. So there's the x component, my y component, uh, looks something like this, fy. Two. And once again, there was no y component for uh, the first hydrogen, right? That was purely in the x-axis. So if I'm looking for the net force, all I do is add up my forces in my x, add up all my forces in the y. Now, this is not a static equilibrium problem where then I'm setting all those forces equal to ma and a is zero. I'm just looking for the net force here. I expect it to come out something different, uh, come out with some number. Uh, might I also point out that whenever you do this, you're adding up your vectors, normally if we were adding up vectors way back in the beginning of the year, you would know what these forces are. You would know what F1 and F2 is, right? And this would be, to get our components, this would be uh, sine theta, right? So maybe I should write that in. It's Fy, right, which is F2 sine theta, right? And uh, in the x component, this, this is equal to whatever F2 cosine theta is, and we know theta, it's 104.5 degrees. Normally, 
uh, way back when, when we were doing this, we would just know what these f's are. We would know f1 and f2, so then we could divide into components. We could, you know, cosine sines. We could add the x's, add the y's, Pythagorean theorem, inverse tangent, that, that repetitious thing that we did, right? Now the difference is we don't actually know the forces, but we know an equation that will give us the forces. So I'm going to go ahead and start substituting everything in to my two axes and to my x and my y. All right, so here I have summed up my forces in the x. It's fx1, which is this, minus fx2, because that's negative. And the y, I only have one component in the y-axis. It's the one going up. I call it up positive and down negative. So some of the forces in the y-axis is just fy2. And so you say, well, what is this fx1, fx2, and fy2? All, all this stuff, right? Well, let's look. The force of x1 is just the force in the x-axis, or and that's, the, that's the direction the force points in, of our hydrogen 1. So it's force of the hydrogen 1. Fx2, though, is a component of uh, the force of the second hydrogen. Fx2 component, right, is F2, right, F2 cosine theta, right, because that's how we get the x component of any, uh, of any vector. We take the cosine of that angle, right? So F2 cosine 104 point, and that should say 4, 5, not 5. So let's slide in a little 4, 5 there. Uh, in the y-axis over here, I have F2 sine 104.45. That's what this component is. So the component of force 2 in the y-axis is F2 sine theta, sine for um, our y-axis. Now, so now we say, well, normally we would know what these numbers are, right? We would know force 1, we'd know force 2. It would be given to us 30 newtons, 25 newtons, whatever. But here, it's not actually given. Instead, we need to use the equation we already have, Coulomb's law, to figure out what F1 and F2 is. So I'm going to substitute in Coulomb's law for those forces now. All right, so now I've substituted in Coulomb's law for each of my forces. Force 1 is, due to Coulomb's law, positive, negative charge, right? I have Coulomb's law, K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. So I'm dealing with this force right here, right? K, charge of my proton, which was plus 1. Charge of my oxygen atom, which was minus 2. Notice I left off my negative sign there uh, because I'm dealing with directions manually, right, positive, negative, here in my, um, in my free body diagram. Uh, I don't want to mess up what I've done here with this subtraction sign, positive going this way, negative going that way there. So I don't want to mess up my, my subtraction sign. So I use the absolute value, 2E. I'm also using E being the charge of the electron, right, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th is a short hand. So technically this is k times 1.6 uh, times 10 to the negative 19th times 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th, but I don't have room to show that. That's why I'm using e's everywhere here. Distance between the two is reported to be 0.9584 angstroms, so times 10 to the negative 10th. Don't forget your squared, r squared in Coulomb's law. Same thing here, right? Between, uh, with force 2, this distance right here is the exact same between the oxygen and the hydrogen, 0.9584 angstroms, right? And it's the same charge, plus 1 for this hydrogen, minus 2 uh, for the oxygen. So the Coulomb's law part is the same, but here's the difference. This is at an angle, right? So I'm getting the x component, thus the cosine 104.45. Some of the forces in the y-axis is exactly the same for the Coulomb's law. I'm getting this component here, right? And plus 1, minus 2, right? So there's the plus 1 and the minus 2 absolute value, right? Using e's to stand for 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 to save a little bit of room. Distance between these two is point. 9584 angstroms. Don't forget your squared, but here's the component part. Here's what gets me my component. Sine 104.45, the angle measured from the uh, positive x axis over there. Now, I have stuff that I can just punch into my calculator. Uh, if, if you go back to adding vectors, I took, uh, I added up all my x's. Here's adding up all the x's and adding up all the y's. That's this part, and there wasn't another y component to add up, right? Now, uh, now that I've done that, added up my x's, added up my y's, I can actually figure out what my x total is and y total is. So I need to punch this into my calculator. All right, and once I, once I punch all that into my calculator, I come up with the total of my x's is 3.76 times 10 to the negative 8th newtons, and my y is 4.8. 
uh, eight six times 10 to the negative eighth newtons. Um, I did make a very large mistake over here. If you went back and you uh, rewatched the adding vectors uh, lesson like I advised you to, you would notice that I'm not supposed to subtract here. I'm actually supposed to add all of them uh, whenever I'm dealing with just adding vectors straight up. Uh, reason for that is if I have my angles measured relative to the positive x-axis, if I have my angles measured relative to the positive x-axis, the cosine of 104.45 comes out to be negative, meaning that this is going to take care of the direction for me. Um, on the other hand, if my angle was measured relative to the negative x-axis over here, or was just measured relative to the closest x-axis is a better way of saying it, right? Measured like down here instead of around to there. Um, then I would actually need to put in positives and negatives manually, which is why whenever we were adding forces, more than likely uh, the angle was measured to the horizontal, so you chose positive and negative uh, direction in your free body diagram. Whenever we were adding vectors, like we're doing right here, the angle was measured to the positive x-axis. We, we, uh, we let the angle take care of it, uh, take care of the direction for us, so positives there. All right, so now that I have my x total and y total, let's think back through adding vectors, right? I drew a picture, get my vectors. The next step was to divide into components. I did that. I divided everybody into components, right? Cosines for x's, sines for y. Dividing, he was the only one that needed to go into components. Then I add my x's over here, and I add my y's. There was only one y, so nothing to add. Right? I had to get the numbers from that. This was the, addition, this was the additional step that we didn't do in adding vectors. I act actually had to calculate what those forces were. Right? Now I got my sum of my x's, some of my y's. So the next step is going to be Pythagorean theorem to get the magnitude of the, of the resultant force. And then uh, inverse tangent to get the angle. All right, so now I have the magnitude of the resultant force, 6.156 times 10 to the negative eighth for sig figs, because the only thing factoring into our significant figures in this problem is the distance between them, because we're treating the values of uh, E, that is, uh, for positive one, negative two, right, electrons there as exact. Um, so four sig figs uh, coming from the inverse tangent of my y total squared, x total squared, square rooting that. Now for an inverse tangent for the angle. And so I do my y's over my x, tan inverse of y total over x total. Whenever I substitute those numbers in, sorry for having to run over here and out of space, um, I end up with my uh, angle of 52.23 degrees using four sig figs. Uh, just a thought for you here. This is just adding vectors. Just adding vectors, so please don't freak out about that. The only difference is I don't know what these forces are at first. Instead, I know the charges that are attracting, so I use Coulomb's law to figure out what those forces are. Then I go through my normal adding vectors. Add the x's, add the y's, Pythagorean theorem, uh, and inverse tangent. Another problem here for you, instead of using an atom or a molecule where I'm dealing with uh, electrons, positive one, electron, negative two electrons or whatever, I'm actually going to deal with charges in microcoulombs here. So I got 3.5 microcoulombs and then two negative 2.5 microcoulombs. And I want to find the net force on this three positive 3.5 microcoulomb charge right up here. Uh, now, I, am, I have uh, notated that this is a equilateral triangle, notated here. Uh, which also means that you automatically know the angles. Equilateral triangle means every angle has to be 60 degrees if it's an equilateral triangle. You'll also see others where it'll be notated that this is a right triangle uh, that will be 45, 45, 90, uh, or other types of right triangles where it's just going to be notated which sides are uh, the same and uh, what maybe one angle is so that you could figure out the quick math. Um, if I'm looking for the force on this guy, just thinking here very quickly, I have two forces on my positive 3.5. Positive and negative attract. So I have a force that comes down this way. I'll call that force 1 over here. So I'll call this object number 1 uh, right there. And then I'm also going to have a force coming down this way, force 2, meaning I'm calling this object number 2. So whenever I draw these two forces on a free body diagram, I have a force like this, F1, and a force like that, F2 as my two force vectors looking for the net force. I expect the net force to go somewhere down there in the middle, right between those two, more than likely straight down on the negative y-axis since everything looks uniform here. Um, I need to know angles, and I don't know angles yet. If I put an xy axis on this thing, though, I know this entire thing right here, 
is 60 degrees. So let's uh, notate this is 60 degrees. And let's draw maybe a little bit heavier y-axis right here on it. Meaning that since here's, you know, if we went ahead and pulled this all the way down 9 degrees, the angle here, right here, is going to be 30 degrees. So I know this is 30 and that is 30. So uh, whenever you add your angles back around, right, figuring out the angle all the, all the way around to the positive x-axis, if we're going to go about this in a traditional sort of adding vectors idea, um, I know the angle with F1 is going to be 240, right, here's my 270 mark coming straight down, 270 minus 30 leaves me 240, um, and then 270 plus 30 gives me 300. So keeping more in step with how I taught you to add vectors initially, I got F1 at 240 plus F2 at 300 is going to give me my resultant force. Next step that I need to do is to break everybody into components. So I have a component for F2, F2 cosine of my uh, angle, which is 300, right? And then I'm going to have F2 sine is going down, F2 sine, 300. And then on the other, F1 is going the opposite way, F1 cosine 240, and going down is uh, F1 uh, sine 240. So now I add my x's, I add my y's. All right, so here's my sum of the forces in the x, sum of the forces of the y, adding up my x, adding up my y. The one difference between this and actually the normal adding vectors, once again, is I don't know the forces. i got to figure out that using Coulomb's law, right? The attraction for 1 is these two, the force of the negative 2.5 pulling on the positive 3.5, and then the uh, F2 is actually the same since it's the same charge. They could have been different, but the force of this negative 2.5 pulling on the 3.5 up here. So now I'm going to substitute in Coulomb's law for all of my forces. All right, so substituting everything in, uh, micro times 10 to the negative 6, also using the absolute value, even though this is negative 2.5, I'm using positive 2.5. So here's the Coulomb's law, force from this guy, pulling him down, cosine 240 degrees. Remember, we got that 240 degrees from that right there. Uh, plus cosine, right, uh, 300 degrees from that right there coming all the way around to the positive x-axis. That's the force. This negative 2.5 is pulling down once again, taking the absolute value, micro times 10 to the negative 6. Sorry, I had to run over a little bit for my 300 degrees cosine. Same thing down here, right, and the y's except my signs are getting me my y components. We're adding the two because whenever we measure an angle back around to the positive x-axis, uh, addition and subtraction are taking care of force and the cosines and sines of the angles. So now I just substitute into my calculator. And I come out perfectly with zero in the x-axis because th th this is perfectly symmetrical. Uh, F1, F2 are have the exact same amount of force because it's the same charges, right? Same charges on that side, same distances between equilateral triangle, right? And uh, the angles are perfectly bisecting the negative y-axis. So my two x-axis, yeah, x components here actually end up canceling out, giving me a x total of zero because they're they're perfect uh, and opposite. They're they're the same number, just opposite directions, um, leaving me just a y component here. Uh, so now I would Pythagorean theorem and inverse tangent, but in reality I don't have to because f(x) is zero. So I know this is my answer, right? Negative, meaning that the final answer is going to be 0 0.012 newtons at 270 degrees. Um, but I'll actually go through the Pythagorean theorem and inverse tangent uh, just for practice for you. So whenever I plug through the Pythagorean theorem, right, fx zero, so I come out with a final force of uh, 0 0.12 newtons, right? And my angle, Fy, inverse tan of Fy divided by Fx, uh, Fx is zero, which gives me an undefined there, so I end up having to go back to just looking at my components. Uh, I know it's going to either be perfectly 90 or perfectly 270 if my x component is zero, uh, and since it's a negative y component, and you can see from the picture, this will come out to be 270 degrees.